Hey everyone, welcome back for another deep dive. We're really excited to dig into some groundbreaking HIV research presented at CROI 2025. Yeah, CROI, the Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections, always delivers a ton of cutting edge science, you know, really pushing the boundaries of what we know about HIV prevention, treatment, and even the possibility of remission. Absolutely. And that's what we're here for today, right? To break it all down, we've got new long-acting pre-pre-P options, studies comparing different treatments head-to-head, -head, and some really fascinating therapeutic approaches that are targeting the virus and even the immune system in completely new ways. Yeah, there were some really impressive studies looking at potential HIV remission strategies too. It's a lot to cover, but we're going to dissect it all, pull out the most relevant and exciting bits, and really try to understand what these findings could mean for the future of HIV not just for researchers and healthcare providers, but for everyone who's impacted by this virus. Exactly, we're talking real world implications here. So should we just jump right in? Yeah, let's get started. All right, well, one of the biggest stories coming out of CROI has to be Gilead's once yearly lenacapavir for pre-P. I mean, this could be a game changer for prevention. No doubt about it. Pre-PP, or pre-exposure prophylaxis, has already revolutionized how we approach HIV prevention. It's been incredibly effective at protecting people who are HIV negative from becoming infected. And we already have lenacapavir available as a twice yearly injection, right? Yeah, that's right. It's a subcutaneous injection given every six months. But what's generating all this excitement is the data from a phase one study on two new formulations of lenacapavir that could be given as a single intramuscular injection once a year. Once a year. I mean, that's huge. Think about the impact that could have on adherence. Taking a daily pill or even getting injections every six months could be tough for some people to maintain. But a single yearly shot, that could be a game changer. Totally. And the study results are really encouraging. Both of these once yearly formulations achieved drug levels that were well above what's needed for effective prevention. And these levels were maintained for over a year, beyond 56 weeks. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's not just about convenience, it's about potentially even greater efficacy because the drug is present in the body at higher levels for a longer period of time. Right. If you look at the numbers, the median trough concentrations at week 52 were really impressive. For one of the yearly formulations, it was 57 nanograms per milliliter. The other one was even higher, 65.6. Compare that to the twice yearly injection, which had a median trough concentration of just 23.4 NGML at the same time point. Wow, those are significant differences. Yeah, and the peak concentrations, so the highest level of the drug right after it's given, were even more striking. 204.7 NGML and 336 NGML for yearly shots versus just 67.3 NGML for the twice yearly one. So it seems like these new formulations are creating this much larger and longer lasting reservoir of the drug in the body. That's pretty remarkable. And and the safety data looks good too. The most common side effect was some pain at the injection site, but it was generally mild to moderate. That's fantastic news. Obviously, more research is needed, but these once yearly lenacapavir formulations have the potential to really transform HIV prevention, making it easier and more effective for people to protect themselves. Definitely something to keep an eye on. Now, moving on to treatment, there was a lot of interest in the LA PayTop P trial which looked at two different treatment regimens for people who are newly diagnosed with advanced HIV. This is a really important area of research because these individuals often face unique challenges. Absolutely. When someone is diagnosed with HIV at a later stage, when the virus has already significantly weakened their immune system, it can be more difficult to get the virus under control and help the immune system recover. So having effective treatment options is crucial. And this trial was designed to compare two commonly used treatment regimens head to head in this population, right? Exactly. One group received a bictograver based regimen this included bictograver, which is a potent integrase inhibitor, along with tenofovir alfenamide, or TAF, and antricitabine, which is also known as FTC. So, a pretty standard combination for HIV treatment these days. Right. The other group was given a regimen based on darunavir. This also included cobistat, FTC, and TA. So both are very effective regimens, but they have different antiviral drugs at their core. And what did the LAPTP trial find? Well, the bictograver based regimen actually came out on top. The study found that a significantly higher percentage of people in the bictograver group achieved virological suppression, meaning their HIV viral load was reduced to an undetectable level. And that's the ultimate goal of HIV treatment, right? 
to suppress the virus to the point where it can't be detected in the blood. Exactly. And not only that, but they also saw faster CD4 cell recovery in the Bictograver group. CD4 cells are those white blood cells that are really important for a healthy immune system, and they're the primary target of HIV. So seeing a faster recovery of these cells is a really good sign. It suggests that the abictograver based regimen is helping the immune system bounce back more quickly. Were there any thoughts on why it might have performed better than the darunavir based regimen in this particular group of people? Well, one of the things that's really great about Bictogravir is that it has a very high genetic barrier to resistance. What that means is that it's harder for the HIV virus to develop mutations that would make the drug ineffective. So it's kind of like Bictogravir is staying one step ahead of the virus, making it more difficult for resistance to develop. Exactly. And this is especially important for people with advanced HIV because they often have a much higher viral load when they start treatment. Right. So there's more opportunity for the virus to mutate and potentially become resistant to the drugs. And on top of that, Bictogravir is also known for having a really favorable safety profile. It's generally well tolerated, which can lead to better adherence to the treatment regimen. You know, if you're not experiencing a lot of side effects, you're more likely to take your medication as prescribed. Absolutely. So it seems like in the case of advanced HIV, starting with a more potent drug that has a high barrier to resistance might be really crucial to ensure rapid and sustained viral suppression, especially given the higher initial viral load and the weakened immune system. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Now, it's important to mention that the researchers did acknowledge some of the challenges they faced in recruiting participants for this trial, which is often the case with studies involving people with advanced HIV. Right, and it's crucial to remember that more research is always needed, especially in diverse populations. Absolutely. But these findings are certainly encouraging, suggesting that Bictograver-based therapy could be a really effective and safe way to achieve viral suppression and promote immune recovery in those who are newly diagnosed with mm. advanced HIV. Definitely a step in the right direction. Speaking of steps in the right direction, let's talk about a study that has a lot of people excited about the possibility of achieving long-term viral control without the need for daily medication. This is the STRIVE trial, which is looking at Aminocore's IMC-M113V. This is some seriously cool science. IMC-M113V is an immunotherapy, specifically what we call a T-cell receptor bispecific. It's like a guided missile for the immune system. A guided missile? That sounds intense. Break that down for me. Okay, so basically IMC-M113V has two sides to it. One side is designed to bind to HIV-infected cells. It recognizes a specific protein complex that's found on the surface of these cells. Think of it like a flag that signals, hey, I'm infected with HIV. Got it. So one side of this molecule is seeking out those infected cells. What about the other side? The other side is designed to bind to T cells. Now, T cells are a type of white blood cell that's really important for immunity. They're like the body's soldiers, and they're capable of killing infected cells. So IMC M113V is basically acting as a bridge, bringing those killer T cells directly to the HIV infected cells. Exactly. It's like saying, hey, T cell, come over here and take care of this infected cell. That's fascinating. And the STRIVE trial was looking at what happens when people who are already on antiretroviral therapy or ART with well-controlled HIV oh. temporarily stop taking their medication while receiving infusions of IMC M113V, right? Right. The idea is to see if this immunotherapy can control the virus even when ART is interrupted. And did it work? They saw some pretty amazing results. In some of the participants, they observed what's called dose-dependent viral control. So the higher the dose of IMC M113V they received, the better the control of the virus. That makes sense. The more the immunotherapy you have in your system, the more effectively it can target and kill those infected cells. Precisely. But what's really remarkable is that three of the participants actually experienced a significant delay in viral rebound after they stopped RT. Their viral load actually dropped to around 200 copies per milliliter. 200? That's incredibly low, especially for someone who's not taking any HIV medication. Yeah. That's a really promising sign that this therapy could potentially lead to sustained viral control. It is. But the big question in HIV cure research is whether you can actually impact the viral reservoir. Right, the reservoir. That's where HIV hides out in the body, in these dormant cells that standard art can't reach. Exactly. And this is where the STRIVE trial findings become even more interesting. They actually found some preliminary evidence that IMC M113V might be impacting the reservoir. Really? How so? Well, they saw a reduction in the amount of HIV gag RNA that was associated with CD4 plus T cells. 
This is a marker of active viral gene expression within those reservoir cells. So it's like the virus is becoming less active in those hidden cells. Yeah, and at the higher doses of IMC M113V, there was also a trend toward a reduction in intact HIV DNA. This is considered a more direct measure of the latent viral reservoir. So it seems like this therapy might be doing something to actually shrink the size of the reservoir, which is incredible. It's still early research, but the findings are definitely exciting. Now, were there any significant side effects associated with this immunotherapy? At the higher doses, some of the participants experienced mild cytokine release syndrome, or CRS. This is a known side effect of some immunotherapies, but it was generally manageable. That's good to know. So while more research is definitely needed, it seems like IMC M113V is showing a lot of promise, both in terms of controlling the virus upon RT interruption and potentially impacting the reservoir. It's definitely a strategy that warrants further investigation. Absolutely. Now, let's talk about another approach to achieving HIV remission. This is the F3-ESH study, which was conducted in South Africa and focused specifically on women. This study is really important for a couple of reasons. First, it's investigating a combination therapy that aims to induce HIV remission. And second, it highlights the importance of conducting research in underrepresented populations. Right. Women are often underrepresented in HIV cure research, so it's fantastic to see a study that's specifically focused on them. And the fact that the study was conducted in South Africa also highlights the need for research in resource-limited settings. These are the areas that are often most heavily impacted by HIV, so it's crucial to ensure that any potential breakthroughs are accessible to everyone who needs them. Absolutely. So tell me about the combination therapy that was tested in the FRE study. The researchers combined two broadly neutralizing antibodies, or BNABs, with a TLR7 agonist. Okay, let's break that down. BNABs have been generating a lot of buzz in HIV research lately. Can you explain what they are and why they're so promising? Sure. BNABs are antibodies that can target a wide range of different HIV strains. You see, HIV is a really tricky virus. It mutates rapidly, which is why it's been so challenging to develop a vaccine. But BNAPs have this unique ability to recognize and bind to conserved regions of the virus, regions that don't change much even as the virus mutates. So they're kind of like master keys that can unlock and disarm many different variations of the virus. Exactly. And the two BNAPs used in the study were VRC07523LS and CTATE P256V2LS. And what about the TLR? 7 agonist. What's its role in this combination? TLR7 agonists work by stimulating the immune system. Think of it this way. Some of the HIV virus hides out in the body in these dormant cells, kind of like sleeping viruses. And these are part of that reservoir we were talking about earlier, right? Exactly. Well, a TLR7 agonist acts like an alarm clock waking up these dormant viruses. Once they're awake, they start producing viral proteins, which then makes the infected cells visible to the immune system, and the immune system can then target and destroy them. That's a really cool mechanism. So you've got these BNABs that are directly targeting the virus and this TLR7 agonist that's boosting the immune system's ability to recognize and eliminate infected cells. Right, it's a two-pronged approach. And the RFES study focused on women who had acute HIV infection and had been on RD for at least 12 months. What were the results? Well, the regimen was generally well tolerated. The most common side effects were mild and related to the infusions. There was one case of grade one cytokine release syndrome, which is a known side effect of some immunotherapies. But overall, it sounds like the safety profile was pretty good. Yeah. And what's really interesting is that they saw some promising signs of viral control. Six of the 20 women who participated in the study were able to maintain viral suppression even after stopping RT for up to 48 weeks. 48 weeks off treatment with the virus still suppressed. That's amazing. And four of those women continued to maintain control for 55 weeks. That's incredible. It suggests that this combination strategy could be really effective for some people. It does. It's important to note that it wasn't effective for everyone in the study, but it does provide valuable insights into the potential of this kind of combination therapy. Absolutely. It highlights the complexity of HIV remission research, but it also gives us hope that we're moving in the right direction. Agreed. Finally, let's talk about an issue that affects many people living with HIV, even when their viral load is well controlled on ART. This is the ongoing immune dysfunction that can persist even when the virus is suppressed. The RESTART study is looking at a new approach to tackling this issue by targeting something called soluble GP120. This is an important area of research because it addresses the fact that HIV isn't just about viral replication, 
it also has a profound impact on the immune system. Right. Even when someone is on effective art and their viral load is undetectable, they can still experience persistent inflammation and their CD4 cell counts might not fully recover. Exactly. And one of the culprits behind this ongoing immune dysfunction is a protein called soluble GP120, or SGP120 for short. What is SGP120 and why is it problematic? So GP120 is a protein that's found on the surface of the HIV virus. It's actually involved in the process of HIV attaching to and entering cells. It's like the key that allows HIV to unlock the door to a cell and get inside. Right. Now, soluble GP120 is basically a version of this protein that's shed from the virus and circulates in the bloodstream. So even if the virus itself isn't actively replicating in large numbers, this protein can still be present in the body and causing problems? Exactly. Soluble GP120 can actually bind to the CD4 receptor on immune cells. CD4, that's the same receptor that HIV uses to get into cells, right? That's right. So when SGP120 binds to this receptor, it can interfere with the normal function of those immune cells, leading to chronic inflammation and preventing those crucial CD4 cells from fully recovering. So it's kind of like SGP120 is gumming up the works of the immune system, even when the virus is under control. Exactly. And that's where Fostum Safer comes in. This is a small molecule inhibitor that can actually block SGP120 from binding to the CD4 receptor. So it's like throwing a wrench into the machinery preventing SGP120 from doing its damage. That's a good analogy. And the restart study is looking at whether Fostum Saver can improve immune recovery in people who are already on stable art. So the goal is to help those CD4 cells bounce back and reduce that chronic inflammation. Exactly. And they're also investigating whether Fostum Saver can reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, which is often elevated in people living with HIV. So it's about improving overall health and well-being even beyond viral suppression. Absolutely. It's about addressing the long-term consequences of HIV infection on the immune system. This has been a truly fascinating deep dive. We've covered so much ground today, from the potential of once yearly pre pre p to the possibility of achieving HIV remission and everything in between. It's amazing to see how much progress is being made in HIV research. It's a really exciting time to be following this field. It is. So I'm curious, what are your biggest takeaways from all of these findings? What has you most hopeful or intrigued about the future of HIV prevention and treatment? I'm really excited about the potential of these new long-acting pre-AP options. I think they could really revolutionize prevention and make it much easier for people to protect themselves from HIV. Uh -huh. I'm also really intrigued by some of these novel therapeutic approaches that are targeting the virus in the reservoir in new ways. I think we're starting to see the possibility of achieving long-term remission, maybe even a cure, becoming more and more realistic. I show your enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. I think the progress we're seeing in HIV research is truly remarkable. And it's not just about the science itself, but also about the growing recognition of the need for research that's inclusive and equitable, that takes into account the needs of diverse populations and resource-limited settings. Absolutely. It's about ensuring that everyone has access to the latest advancements in HIV prevention and treatment. Well said. As always, I want to thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. This has been an incredibly informative and thought-provoking discussion. It's been my pleasure. And to all of you listening, thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the latest HIV research. We hope you found it valuable. And we encourage you to stay informed, stay engaged, and stay hopeful. The future of HIV is looking brighter than ever before. <laughs>